<coughs> it's unexpected and it can be rather agonizing. <coughs> you reach over to pick up a package, you bend down to tie your shoe, you bend over to pick up the child that's got their arms up waiting for you to pick them up, and suddenly something goes terribly wrong. You know it instantly. Wrench, tweak, tear, back, neck muscle, disc, nerve. Something has gone completely offline. And in the twitch of a muscle, but certainly not a twinkle of an eye, moving has gone to being misery in your life. Even at this time of the year, with a focus on back to school, kids going back now, there are medical studies that have been done in the last several years that are tracking how poorly kids' backs are after years of carrying heavy backpacks. And sometimes the backpacks are bigger than the kids themselves, and you wonder how they don't topple over under the weight of the backpack. And they're tracking children for 18 years until they finish high school. If you've never studied anatomy and something goes wrong in your neck, your back, you're immediately an expert on just how intimately connected your back is to every other part of your body. Your arms and legs, your head, your shoulders, your hands, your feet, everything hurts to move. When there is a wreck in the, around the spinal cord, the superhighway of our nerves and pain receptors, all the other roadways of our body, all the muscles and nerves suffer together. In this week's Gospel text, Jesus deals head-on with a debilitating back issue. The woman Jesus sees in the synagogue the woman he calls forward, without her even seeking him out, is described as being bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. Luke doesn't tell us much else about this woman. We don't know if she was wealthy or if she was dirt poor. We don't know if she was someone who the community honored or ostracized or just didn't even know existed. All we know from the text is that she was a woman who was, had a, what was perceived to be a spirit that had crippled her over, bent her in half for the last 18 years. And we know that despite that affliction, this woman continued to go to worship the Lord along with God's people. This is a picture of a woman in China completely bent over with a bad back, leading her blind husband with a stick so that he can fall. Jesus not only called this woman forward, he called an obviously diseased woman into his presence. And that was unorthodox because in his day, in that era, disease was still viewed as a sign of divine displeasure and even punishment. This woman's condition was therefore seen as both pitiable and as some form of justified punishment from God. Her physical malady, Luke tells us, suggested some spiritual disease. And in his immediate relationship with this woman in the midst of the context of worship, Jesus demonstrates both his divine authority and his unique compassion. He saw a woman in great need. And he took immediate, miraculous action to meet that need. There in worship, Jesus went into action. He heals the woman, but not because of this woman's any expression of faith on her part. But she responded to her healing by immediately straightening up and praising God. Prior to Jesus speaking the words and laying his hands on her and healing her, we hear nothing about her faithfulness. We hear nothing about her trust in God. And Jesus' response to this woman's bent over condition appears to be a spontaneous moment 
of incredible, overwhelming compassion for one of God's beloved children. Something about this woman and her body warped into a question mark, struck Jesus so strongly that he sprang into action without hesitation to bring a new sense of wholeness to someone who had been at half mass for 18 years. Can you imagine? Like I had the children try to do. Can you imagine living life for a day completely bent over like that? Let alone 18 years. And did you notice the response of the synagogue worship leader? And did you notice the response of the congregation to what Jesus did? The leader was an example of an excellent micromanager, pointed out all the apparent legal reasons why what Jesus had just done in healing this woman was illegal and wrong and should never have happened on the Sabbath day. And Jesus counters with the real truth of God's Word, which supports releasing farm animals and merciful care for them, even on the Sabbath day. So shouldn't we be releasing people and merciful and compassionate to people, even on the Sabbath, he asks? People who are all made in the image of God. And the congregation's response was, Way to go, Jesus. They wholeheartedly supported the miracle that Jesus did. And they didn't support the micromanaging of the worship leader. No matter how many calcium supplements we might take, no matter how many workouts with weights, bone strengthening injections we might get as we age, gravity wins and we shrink. Our sons, both well over six feet tall, I never made it past six feet, but I was never shorter than six feet as an adult. Now they let me know in a few uncertain terms that I'm shrinking. <laughs> and I must be less. Oh, you couldn't be taller than 5'11 now, Dad. I'm shrinking. We bend. We break. We shrivel. It's part of the human condition. But there's another inevitable part of the human condition that bends us down with even more weight and pain than gravity and age. It's the weight of life, the weight of sin, the weight of failure, the weight of all those if-onlys, what-ifs, why on earth did I? It's the weight of losses, the weights of the weight of longing, the weight of everything in our lives that we have messed up and all that we have missed out on, it's a weight that easily brings us down far faster than gravity and age and brings us low. It's a weight that bends us down long before our skeletal structure starts to show the age effects. And then we start to feel the... <clears throat> <clears throat> and then we start to feel the weight of the world on our shoulders you ever been there? are you still there? with the weight of the world on our shoulders it doesn't matter what our age is we think we can start carrying more and more weight we all know there's something better that we could be we all know that we don't measure up. We all know that our backs are bent over with a variety of things and that our spirits lock up little by little. What's weighing you down today? Maybe it's physical pain. Maybe it's an illness, a disease. Maybe it's staggering financial debt. 
Maybe it's the death charge of depression. A chronic disease that makes every day feel like at one and the same time some sort of merciful blessing and yet also a horrible, painful burden. Maybe it's a family in crisis. Maybe it's family members far and away and appearing to be uncaring and not wanting to be in touch. Maybe it's challenging work demands and pressures. Maybe it's challenging school demands. Maybe it's worry over our children's or our grandchildren's futures. We are all bent people. The weight of the world bends us over. In fact, life can provide us with an endless supply of weights that we <coughs> accept on our backs or we put on our backs. And they bend our souls as well. Jesus delivered the woman who was bent in half from the weight of an illness, the weight of life. And he offered her her real identity. Jesus did not define her in terms of her bent over back. Jesus did not define her in terms of an illness. Jesus refused to define her in terms of her weakness and her brokenness. Jesus referred to her by her true identity. Did you hear it when we read the passage? What did he call her? Daughter of Abraham. Do you understand? If you have diabetes, it doesn't mean you're a diabetic, period. Jesus would say, you're a beloved child of God who has diabetes. Do you suffer from depression? That's not what defines us. A beloved child of God who struggles with depression is different. How many of you, how many of us have arthritis? Yeah. Well, we're not arthritic, period. End of statement. That defines me and you. We are a beloved child of God who struggles with arthritis. We are a son or a daughter of the King of all kings. Our weights and our burdens, our diseases and our disorders ought not to define us. God defines us as his beloved. In the words of the 1877 Hymn of Our Faith by Harriet Buell, I am a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I am a child of the King. <clears throat> you remember last week I said, if you want to come to a, a short worship service, come Tuesday night to Presbytery. We had a 40, no, it was a 38 minute Presbytery service, worship service. And somebody emailed me the ne that very late that night, and I saw it and read it the next day, and he said it was really good to be reminded in the midst of liturgy who we are. <coughs> and whose we are. We do well. Because anybody else here forgetful from time to time? <laughs> About anything? I mean, it was Friday. I'm working in my office. Julie's in the, in the secretary's office working in the I went over to her office to hand her something and say something, and I got there and handed it to her, and I couldn't remember what I was going to say. And it's just from there to there. <laughs> oh my goodness. We are forgetful. It is so good to be reminded, and that's one of the things that worship does for us. It reminds us together who defines us, and that's God, and what he defines us as. Child of the King, a beloved child of God. And when this woman was touched by the living Lord, he identified her as a beloved daughter of Abraham, a child of God. And in that glorious identity as a child of God, she was recharged and reborn to be touched by God. 
And we need this touch every day. Is to be reminded that we are called. Beloved. Beloved. I had a friend in my undergrad in London who I lived with him for a summer. It was painful. <laughs> and, and he grew up in a family where he was told over and over and over again that he wasn't really wanted. He was simply a mistake. And oh well. Can you imagine? Please. If you don't remember anything else from anything I ever say, remember who you are. Beloved Terry. Absolutely. Beloved child's child. Beloved children of God, the living King. We're all locked up. And some of us, our souls, our spirits are seized up, bent over with the enormous weight of the cares of life. But Jesus treats us the same as he treated this woman. He cares for us the same. He touches us with his gracious love, with his compassionate care, and with his mercy. And he invites us to do the same to everybody that we meet. Because I guarantee you there's not a person you will meet who is not bent over from something in this life. To offer them and to offer one another that sort of compassionate care that God offers to us in Christ. What a gift it is. So will you love someone that way this week? And maybe just as importantly, if not only a little bit more important, will you and I let God in Christ love us that way this week? Thanks be to God. Amen.